We are still there. We'll have a chat. Yes, sir. Hmm. Uh, good evening, Matini from Milada Kelavu Sagadam. In the Namaka class, I regret the uh, Vice Admiral Kanan Sarana, Sir Retirai Navy Ledu, uh, Sarne Navy Lekula Yatragal, Valade Sagarama Yatula Yatragalana. Adalari the Rivati Mudale, College of Engineering in the Electronics and Communication Engineering. Uh, honors Navy. Finally, uh, then Navy uh, joined you. That's why the Naval Naval Training, a bachelor top right. That's why the Navy IIT Pawel in the M Tech Control and Guidance M Tech Sambalchu. Mumbai University in the Masters of Management. Additional DG Q and A of Navy, and Dari Rear Admiral Vice Admiral Adivishta Seva Nadal Nalgi, Rikal Gudi, Adate, Rajamadrichu, Chief of Material I, Rakal Jorjidu, Randarati Padimunil, Third Presidential Award, Distributed Service, Param Vishta Parishesha Anjursham, Corporate Secretary, Elandi, MD and CUI, Jolinoki. People, Kaibatur was settled on the Rivandar of Sodeshiana. Knowledge management, passion, Lana, Sarfu, or Kidundi, another shipbuilding, indigenization, upon a defense technologies, industries four point zero, techniques, signal of Shangal, Padiginu, Padiginu Matralla, Kritimai, Samuadana, Nalu Seven. Can you carry on the la carrying look? What are a Kutte de Ode? Some good like it against the beginning. So, the shame, what are some of the shame? Thank you, Admiral Sir. So, you are welcome to the presentation. Okay, can I start? Sure, sir. Okay, thank you. So, good evening to everyone, and uh, I would like to wish all the people who are in this webinar, uh, the best of health, happiness, and joy in the new year. And uh, I would like to extend this to them and their families as well. I'm thankful to Dr. Sabu for having given me another opportunity uh, to speak on a topic which I feel has got very special relevance to the present as well as the future generations of our country. Today's topic is about ice-covered Arctic region of our Earth. We all have learned uh, during school that Arctic and Antarctic regions, which remain covered by ice throughout the year and almost inaccessible for anyone to reach there by some safe mode of transportation. During the school, we studied about the climate there, as I mentioned, inaccessibility, and the sparse population of people and polar animals which were staying in both North Pole as well as South Pole. I don't think uh, during my days in the school, and maybe many of you who are in the audience would also agree with me, that 
the geography classes ever considered discussing what will happen if the ice reduces in Arctic or Antarctic? What will happen? I don't remember uh, discussing this or the teacher telling about this in school. And uh, this is actually sort of happening now. So we need to look at this phenomenon of polar ice melting and how it's going to affect us. But today's talk is only about Arctic and not Antarctic. And uh, in my discussion with you, I will be highlighting how this phenomenon as the years go by has got an impact on India's economy, India's security, and on the scientific front, what all impact can happen to us. Many of us may see this during our lifetime, but definitely our children will uh, get to uh, experience it uh, during their uh, lifetime. If you notice the title of my talk, I have intentionally included a word called four board in the title. It is essentially to hint that there is a situation, a bad situation to come due to melting of ice. And I would attempt to highlight the various aspects in my presentation. I think I'll take about 40 to 45 minutes to cover this presentation. So with this, I will upload my presentation. Just give me a minute. Are you able to uh, see? My yes, presentation. Sir. Yes, yes. Okay. okay. Uh, so, can I uh, now start my presentation? You're able okay. to see, right? Yes, sir. exactly. Okay. So, as I said, what does the melting Arctic ice forebode for India? So, let us start discussing this issue. This is the Arctic region of our earth. You can see a dotted line here. This dotted line has been drawn at 66.5 degrees latitude. So on the globe, if you draw a dotted line along the 66.5 degree latitude, it will look like this. And this, area within this ring, within this circle, is called the Arctic region. It accounts for four percentage of Earth's surface area. In this, within this circle, there is sea and there is land. The sea, which is the Arctic Ocean, which we have learned in social studies, is in the center. It covers around 14 million square kilometers and it is almost 80 plus percentage of the whole Arctic region within the circle. And it is surrounded by land of different countries around it. So there are eight countries around it. We'll come into the details a little later. But I just want to highlight one aspect. If you see my second bullet, it says the sea, which covers around 84% of this Arctic region, has one third its area underlain by continental shelf. Many of you may not be knowing what is continental shelf. So I'll just take a minute. See, you're on land now. 
when it goes to the coast sea, the water level is higher than the land. And after some time, the land start dropping and it's only water. But there are certain areas in, the, in our earth where the land extends under the sea almost, almost at the same level as the territory, land territory. Slightly lower, it extends. Or it drops very, very slow. It is actually an extension of our land into the sea, but remains below the sea. And that is called continental shelf. Because when Earth was formed by movement of the Titanic plates, this had happened. And some places you have this sort of structure in our land submerged underwater. Uh, this is too much of geography, you may feel, but this has got a relevance. If your, your country has got continental shelf, then the EZ is much larger than a country which does not have continental shelf. EZ, I'm sure all of you know, exclusive economic zone. If EZ is 200 miles for a non-continental shelf, it is 350 miles for those coastlines which have got continental shelf. So just keep this factor in mind. This aspect is what uh, the UN body has decided. It is not fully approved yet, but it is likely to come very soon. And India will also hugely benefit if this, this approval is given, because then we will have more area for our economic resources, which are lying in the sea. Okay. Now, there are about 40 lakhs people staying within this circle. Four zero lakhs or four million. And the biggest city within this circle is a city called Murmansk, which is in Russia. I've shown the arrow there. So that's about Arctic region. We are covered. Let's go to the next slide. Let's see what's the climate. The Arctic region climate is influenced by sea ice and glacier. Both are ice only. But there is a difference in their terminology. If the ice is on top of the sea, it's called sea ice. Glaciers are on top of land. Like we have glaciers in Himalayas. But if ice freezes in Arctic or in Antarctic, it's called sea ice, if it is on water. So this is a difference which I want you to highlight to you. But how this ice is formed and glaciers are formed and how they remain so is through a process, a climatological process. Because our Earth is inclined about its axis, sun rays don't reach the pole throughout the year. You and me get sun every day. Monday to Sunday, we get sun. But if you are in Arctic region, you don't get sun for many days. For weeks on, you don't get sun. It again, depends on where you are in the latitude. So we're not discussing that now. But because the sun's rays are falling less, there's less heating. There's absence of sunlight. One reason. Second reason is whenever sun rays come, which will happen uh, when Earth is going around in revolution, the next set of six months, the reflection will take place of sun rays and go away. So both these factors cause sustenance of sea ice and glacier. Now, in summer months, I will come to what is summer months and winter months. In summer months, sunlight is available for more number of hours for, and ice starts melting little by little. And the 
it will continue during the months of summer months when sun's rays are going to fall by a small amount. The average duration of summer is three months, June, July, August in Arctic. And nine months, it is winter. In winter, it is minus 40 degrees average and 10 degrees plus 10 degrees during summer. If you go closer and closer to the North Pole, it will become even worse. The temperature will become more severe. But I'm just telling you the average temperature, just to, for you to get a feel of what the climate is like. In winter, sea ice and glaciers build up. They become thicker, three meters, four meters big uh, ice blocks are formed during winter. While in summer, they gradually melt and merge with seawater. This happens every summer, it happens. But by winter, again, they'll build up. So you have a process of some melting taking place, but in winter, it gets uh, accumulated again. So this has been going on for thousands of years, and there's been a balance in this because of the atmospheric temperature, the sun's rays falling at some periodicity, etc. And it was very stable, at least till uh, 1980 and things like that. After that, people started seeing changes. I'll come to that a little later. Just a comparison with Antarctic. Antarctic temperatures are more severe and melting of ice is less. Antarctic also ice melts during summer months. Their summer months are different from the summer months of Arctic because they're in Southern hemisphere and Arctic is in Northern hemisphere. But Antarctic temperatures are more severe and melting is less. So today we are more worried about Arctic because the melting is more. And Antarctic, they're not so much worried about. Let's see. This is a satellite picture of Antarctic and Arctic. What you see in white is ice or glacier. Antarctic, obviously, you can see it's a big area covered with white. And Arctic, it is less. Antarctic, there's a difference between Antarctic and Arctic. Antarctic is land surrounded by sea. So in, in, within this white uh, area where it's full of ice, there are mountains which are covered with glaciers, just like Himalayas, almost as high as some of the mountains there. But the sea is all around this land. There are no countries in Antarctic. There are no permanent population, no one. People may go visit for some research and scientific expedition, but otherwise Antarctic belongs to no one. Antarctic region has no ownership, but Arctic, as I told you earlier, at the dotted line which I drew, there are eight countries having land in Arctic. Eight different countries. And another difference is, it is sea in the center, surrounded by land. Now, this is a huge difference because when you have land, there's population. When there is population, there is human activity. When there's human activity, there is always some uh, uh, heat which is generated due to either industrial activity, economic activity, et cetera. And you will find the warming up is more. One of the reasons why Arctic is getting warmer than Antarctic is because of the land all around, which has got as such land uh, heats up the place faster. On top of it, you have the population. You see the population in Arctic, as I told you, it's 4 million or 40 lakhs, while there's nobody in Antarctic. Okay, let's go forward. Again, coming back to a similar diagram, but here I've shown the eight countries are there. The list is there. You can just go through the list. Uh, 
There are small countries like Iceland. There are big countries like Russia. 50% of the land within the circle is Russia. 50% of the population is also Russia. There's some USA, there's Canada, there's etc. Et okay. Now, how is the governance taking place in Arctic? Because in Antarctic, as I told you, there's no, no territory of any country. So there's no governance model. But there is an international treaty saying that we will not do militarization. We will not do any industrial activity. All these things are there. So Antarctic is fairly well, uh, well looked after by uh, our human population staying outside as well as by the various countries. Now let's look at what's Arctic. Every country, I told you there are eight countries, they look after their own respective territories. And there are some common issues in that area. I shall come to that. Few countries have got overlapping territorial claim. Now this is where the continental shelf is coming. You have continental shelf of Canada coming under the sea. You have continental shelf of Russia also coming under the sea. But there is enough space for earmarking the 350 miles for each of them. So there are overlapping taking place. And there are contests between two of this, saying this is my land, it is my area, this is my EZ, whatever is here, it belongs to me. So in Arctic, there are such problems. Huge number of problems amongst many uh, countries, at least about four or five of them have got territorial problems, which are not yet resolved. And there's an undersea mountain also, which has made this uh, territory boundary to be uh, adjudicated at the UN level. I told you in Antarctica, there's an international treaty to protect the environment. In Arctic, there is no treaty. Every country looks after its territory and there is enough freedom for each country to utilize its territory the way it wants. Just like they have the freedom to use uh, economic activity, industrial activity, whatever is possible. But they have formed the Arctic Council in 1996 to address common issues by the eight countries. There are issues of climate, there are issues of uh, uh, type of vessels which can operate, the fisheries which can take place, the scientific expeditions which can take place, etc., etc. So there's an Arctic Council which addresses these common issues. And the Arctic Council is not truly really by these eight countries. There are some observer states in that. India is one of them. India, and of course China also, from 2013, are both in the Arctic Council. As observers, they can participate in discussion. They can share their views. And India has uh, a fair amount of experience in treating, in uh, dealing with glaciers and things like that, because we have in Himalayas. So on scientific front, on research front, we are able to share some valuable knowledge with the other states who are a member of Arctic Council. But just remember, Arctic Council has got eight countries and 13 observers. What are the natural resources there? I'm telling you the important ones oil, natural gas, and minerals, they're rich in this deposits. That is why countries are fighting for their EZ boundary, because there is oil and natural gas, and of course, minerals, we talked about it in the last talk, is also equally important now. USA has estimated that 13% of world's oil, and 30% of gas is in this region. So it's a very rich area for oil and gas. That is why there's a big rush towards Arctic by those eight countries to make sure they're able to exploit that area for oil and gas. Russia, which I told you, has almost 50% of the area within that circle is already extracting a lot of oil and gas, which has come to 15% of its GDP today. Today, Russia's GDP, 
15% is coming from Arctic. And if you are buying Russian oil for our country, some of it are coming from Arctic, subject to that they are able to transport it from there to outside. We'll touch upon that aspect soon. And there are mineral deposits of various types, but extraction is a bit, mining is a bit of a problem in ice covered area. So uh, scientific research is going on how we can do it. So far, it's more on oil and gas and less on minerals. Now, transporting an item from Arctic is a problem. How do you transport? By land, you cannot much because all covered with ice. You can transport large quantities only by ships, but those ship routes are open only for a few weeks in a year. So you can take out from there only when the sea has become slightly devoid of ice. Then only it is open, ship can move. Now, for uh, Russia, of course, has laid a lot of pipelines for the oil and the gas to go, which they have laid. So they are able to send it uh, throughout the year through the pipelines which they have laid within towards their territory. I'm talking about taking away the item from that place to another place, why ships? That is a problem. Now, this is a map. You see a red line and you see a green line. The red line is a shipping route along Canada, USA, that is Alaska, and Canada. The green line is along Russia, and it comes down to Norway. Sorry. So these two routes open up during summer months, and ships can ply. They can cut across from Pacific Ocean to Atlantic Ocean through a shortcut, but only during those summer months. The Northern Sea Route, which I will call as NSR from now onwards, which is the green line, is less affected than the red line. And today it is open for about two, two and a half months. People feel by 2040, for four months it'll be open because more ice would have uh, melted and the sea may be navigable by ships. Of course, uh, ships will still require icebreaker ships to accompany them in case they uh, encounter large blocks of floating ice uh, and thereby preventing them to move forward. So just remember the Arctic route which is along Russia, called the Northern Sea Route or NSR, is open for two, three months in a year. And it is a short journey from uh, Pacific to Atlantic. Otherwise, it will go through roundabout routes. Now, take the example of China. I've shown here China, a place called Dal Dalian. The red line is what the ships normally use. It goes via Middle East, Suez Canal, there's that excellent reach, Rotterdam and Netherlands. But if you use NSR, you come through this blue line. It is 4,000 miles less and it takes less time. I'm just giving an example. It is applicable for China, it is applicable for Japan, it is applicable for Korea. It's applicable for Russia also. If they use NSR, they save time. They save energy. They reduce cost of transportation. So there's an attraction for these countries. Remember, Russia, China, Japan, Korea, etc. If the Arctic can open up, then they can utilize it and they will have advantage in trade, less cost, and therefore their economy will prosper. It's a huge advantage. If you go via Suez Canal, you have to pay some fees there. 
or if you're coming via, uh, if you're coming via Pacific, you have to pay fees in Panama Canal. So here you don't have to pay all that. You may remember March 2021, Suez Canal was blocked for seven days by a ship which got jammed within the canal. Uh, so those sort of problems are not expected in the Arctic route if they open up for uh, four months, after some time, five months, like that, if they open up, then the countries which are possible to use that route, the blue color, they will benefit. India doesn't have any benefit. You see the map, the blue route is of no interest to India, but others will utilize it and they will take over trade. They will have more exports. Our exports will get hit, you understand? So we'll go more into this issue a little later. If Arctic route materializes by extensive melting of ice, as I told you, many of these countries will benefit, which are easily open to using Northern Sea Route. As I told you, no advantage to India. But, if Arctic Sea Route is not open, if the Arctic Sea Route does not open because of ice not melting, then there are huge benefits to the globe, various countries, including India. So at this point of time in our discussion, I am saying Arctic ice should not melt. But some other countries, they don't mind if it melts. For us, Arctic ice should not melt. And one of the disadvantages I've already pointed out, and more will come as we go along. Now you look at this map, uh, satellite picture. The yellow line is what the cover of ice in 1979, let's say 80, for more than 42 years back. Today, the ice cover is less than the white area, white patch. But this white patch of 2012, it has shrunk and it is estimated that there's a reduction of 4.5 percentage of area every 10 years. So within 200 plus years, all the ice will go. If that goes at this rate, should it happen? If it happens, obviously Arctic Sea Route uh, ships can ply, but what are the other problems you will face? How will this affect India? That is our question. That is the point of discussion. I've highlighted to you in the international community, some countries benefit by this and they may be looking forward for that while we don't benefit by this Arctic Sea Route, but we lose out on some other areas. I'm going to cover those points in the subsequent slide. Okay, now I have to take you back to social studies for some time. Uh, just bear with me. It's a very interesting concept, but I will slowly, slowly uh, explain this. You see there's a red belt and a blue belt. Red belt and blue belt show the ocean currents. Some currents are on the surface of the ocean. Some currents are below the surface. Some currents are below the surface. And this scientists have explained that it is called the ocean conveyor belt. Like a conveyor belt moves in the airport with your luggage. Just like that, warm water and cold water go around the world very slowly, of course. They go and they move in a particular direction as shown in this diagram, in this image. The direction depends on wind pattern, Earth's rotation, and the differences in water temperature, salinity, etc., etc. Okay. But 
This is how the earth was born. And it has been working from now. Nobody has come and changed it. It has been working for thousands and thousands of years. This belt has been moving. And warm water has been going along the red. And cold water come, moves along the blue. Now, warm water, which is from tropical area like in India, are warmer because we are in tropical area, water is warmer, less salty, and therefore lighter. Just remember this. The water in tropical areas is warmer and less salty, and therefore it is lighter. But the water closer to poles, closer to Arctic region, are colder, more salty, and heavier. So, they, the heavy water, and I said heavy water, I mean heavier water, the polar water actually sinks while the tropical water remains on the surface. So, the red belt moves on the top, on the surface of the ocean, while the blue belt is below the surface of the ocean. It moves. So, it goes on top and then it when it returns, it comes as blue. Let's see how it, how it works. So when red belt or when warm water goes towards the poles, we are discussing Arctic, therefore North Pole, it reaches there. And this reaching is because of Earth's rotation and wind and uh, differences between uh, uh, temperature, etc. When it reaches the air, it get, becomes cold. So it releases the heat to atmosphere, becomes cold water, and it sinks. So more warm water flows, that also sinks. More water flows again, and that also sinks. And the cold water starts returning towards Antarctica. While this is a very slow moving conveyor belt, Warm waters keep the temperature in Europe, in Europe as very moderate. And similarly for us in tropical, when it comes back as cold water under the sea, it is not that hot in tropical. It is moderating the climate all over the world. And that's how it has been working for thousands of years. Now, what happens is, this delicately balanced cycle of warm and cold water is moderated the climate in tropical as well as polar regions. I want to tell you the cycle time scientists have estimated to be 1000 years. That means you take a quantity of water, start from one point in the conveyor belt and see the speed with which it moves and then take the total distance it has to go, go around and come back, it will take 1,000 years for it to come back to the same point. So this is a very slow moving conveyor belt and has been very effectively moderating the climate of tropical region, polar region, and there has been a steady pattern of climate for us in India. We're talking about India mostly. So there's a steady pattern of climate over the years. Now, what happens if more Arctic ice melts? When more Arctic ice melts, the Arctic ice melting more is because of carbon emission, temperature going up, global warming, etc. That has got nothing to do with this conveyor belt. But when more Arctic ice melts, it becomes water. And that water is added to sea. When that water is added to sea in the Arctic, it becomes less salty. It becomes less dense. So let me repeat this once more. When the Arctic ice melts due to global warming, which is caused by carbon emission, which is caused by uh, unfettered use of uh, fossil fuel by all countries, so when the ice melts to fresh water, the Arctic water becomes 
less salty and less dense. When it becomes less dense, it does not go down that fast. It goes down, but goes down slowly. When it goes down slowly, the warm water is not able to rush in because the cold water is not moved down. So warm water is not able to go in. So you have a plumbing problem that the cold water does not sink fast enough for the warm water to go from the tropics. Now what happens? Warm water is only slowly going. The conveyor has become slow, slower. I won't say as it takes 1000 years, now it has become more slow. And therefore, tropical seas, they are getting overheated. They become warmer because it's not, not moved away to Arctic. Because that is not, because ice is diluted that and that is not sinking. So therefore, tropical water becomes warmer. When tropical water becomes warmer, very simple. Now we are, now we are going to talk about India. Leave out Arctic. We have understood that if Arctic ice melts, tropical sea will become warmer. Because warm water is not able to go via the conveyor belt. So when tropical water becomes warmer, there is more evaporation. When there's more evaporation, more rain-bearing clouds. This has started upsetting Indian monsoon. Indian monsoon, which had a steady pattern for hundreds of years, for many decades of years, you and me have experienced it. But in the last 10, 12 years, let's say 10 years, it has started becoming slightly erratic. You will have heavy rain in some places and very low rain in some other places. So the pattern of Indian monsoon is getting affected by the Arctic ice melting. So I hope you have understood the linkage between Indian monsoon and the Arctic ice melting. And Arctic ice melting is because of global warming. So what do we do? How do we make sure that our monsoon doesn't get affected? If Indian monsoon is affected, it affects. There are many natural disasters which will happen. It affects agriculture. It affects economy. So many things happen, but the cost for this change in the monsoon pattern is because of Arctic ice, which is caused by global warming. So you have to attack global warming and make sure global warming is controlled. So we are concluding like that in this particular slide, and then we'll go further. So government of India has embarked on many programs to control carbon emission and study the trend in melting of ice. Now, I'm not going to go into the programs to control carbon emission because it's another topic, but you all know we have gone for renewable energy, solar, windmills, uh, and green hydrogen, and so many things which we have done. So we will not enter there, but we look at what are they doing to study the trend of melting of Arctic ice. First is they formed a new national center for polar and ocean research in 1998. They formed it to do all the studies. They set up a research station in Arctic in a place called Svalbard in Norway, which is manned for six months in a year. Six months it is closed down. I'll show you a photograph of that. This is how it looks. This is open for six months. It's called Hibadri. It operates. Scientists operate from there. They do a lot of work and then they come back after six months. India applied for observer status. We got it in 2013. India has installed in 2014 an underwater laboratory. Very interesting. It's called Indark, Indian in Arctic, uh, in Arctic, Indark, somewhere near an island in Svalbard. And that underwater laboratory is 192 meters below the sea surface to study temperature, salinity, density, and various issues. We talked about it very briefly about salinity, temperature, density, et cetera. But there is an underwater laboratory which India has installed 
And how does it remain underwater for 192? There is a technique called mooring by which it is anchored down with wires and anchors, etc. And it remains there. From there, the data comes uh, to the island, a nearby island. And from there, it comes back to the laboratory for further analysis. India, of course, took many expeditions to Arctic. We don't have a polar research vessel yet. There's a chance that we may have it in four or five years, but we have been hiring ships and going. Now I'm going to show you something interesting. India deposited Thurdal. Thurdal, Thorapparip, as they call it in Malayalam. In 2014, in a global seed vault, it's Valbad. You know, there is a global seed vault where seeds of all types, rice, wheat, millet, bajra, dals, etc., samples are kept inside a mountain in this Norwegian uh, city, inside the mountain. I'll show you a photo where it looks like this. It is going inside the mountain and all the samples are taken uh, to this place after they are fully checked out that they don't have any uh, viruses or bacteria, etc. Then they are taken inside and stored there. And it extends into the vault, into the mountain. It's about 150 meters deep inside the mountain. I mean, it goes inside the mountain. And all countries are doing it. More than 100 plus countries are deposited their, uh, uh, their uh, items there. And India has also done it in 2014. Uh, we have deposited Thurdal, as I told you. So many of you may not be knowing there's a global seed vault uh, in uh, Norway. And India has also gotten a collaboration with NASA via ISRO for solid satellite monitoring of ice. I showed you some photographs of uh, ice coverage and etc. cetera. Uh, India has uh, joined this NASA group so that we are also able to get this data from our satellite. And we issued a policy document in March 22, 10 months back. I'll be discussing this policy document and its contents uh, in another uh, 10 minutes. Uh, so let's go forward. Now, what is Russia's stance on Arctic ice? I don't require to explain. Russia is already benefiting a lot. Uh, obviously, they want more and more oil and gas to come more and more ships to ply, et cetera. So they are uh, keen on opening the Arctic uh, route for shipping, which means they don't mind if the ice melts. But I will just quickly run through the slide. Russia has got 50% area, 50% population. They have been using their oil and gas. They've got some disputes on territory. And they have said, uh, NSR, I will give a icebreaker whenever anybody wants. I will help the ship to go. They did that when the ship ever given blocks to West Canal. China and Russia have joined hands and created a lot of infrastructure for oil, rigs, energy extraction, setting up ports, common research centers. China, almost to the extent of about $60 billion have been invested along with Russia. Russia didn't have that much money, but China has invested to make sure that Arctic, we are ready to completely uh, have a dominant position, a power position, uh, when the ice melts significantly. Indirectly, they don't mind if the ice melts. They don't have a naval base, but they'll uh, have very soon. They have issued some joint statements with China, how to develop Arctic, etc. Of course, the word sustainable is always there. USA, a very safe uh, approach. They said uh, we should protect the region. We should uh, uh, make sure the melting of ice, uh, it, can, it may happen because of global warming, but we should have it calibrated. They should be peaceful, stable. So they are making a a uh, very safe line. And they have also issued some strategy documents. They have some partnership with Canada. 
and they have issued uh, October 22, three months back, they issued a document saying US will look after uh, Arctic region for security, climate change, development, sustainable development, and international cooperation. So I talked about Russia. I talked about the USA. So let me have a word. What is China saying? China says they issued a white paper in 2018. And look at its four, four key principles. Understand, protect, develop, and participate. Very aggressive. They want to understand. That's fine. You're studying. Then they'll say, I will protect. Then I will develop. And I'll participate in governance of Arctic. So they are, their statement itself is a little uh, aggressive. Uh, they want to play a dominant position, uh, a dominant role, I mean, uh, in the Arctic. Uh, they don't mind using the Arctic shipping route because hugely economical for them, for their trade. They don't have to go by Indian Ocean. They can go directly towards Europe. They can directly go to USA for their trade, etc. They save a lot of money expenditure on that. They have huge investments in Iceland. Uh, they have uh, joint uh, scientific expeditions with uh, Greenland. Uh, they have laid underwater uh, sea cables, satellite tracking centers, uh, many laboratories. All this they have invested. And as I told you earlier, uh, they have invested about $60 billion in Russia. But if you include Iceland, Greenland, Canada, everything, it comes to $90 billion they have invested uh, in, uh, in Arctic to make sure Arctic gets developed. Obviously, they have some uh, ambition about what role they will play uh, once uh, Arctic becomes uh, less ice prone. And they have advocated the cooperation between Arctic and non-Arctic states should be there in all fields for mutual benefit. See that word, for mutual benefit. That means China also benefits, Arctic uh, nation also benefits. That means they will participate in oil exploration, they will do in mineral extraction, they will do in gas extraction, and of course they will have some uh, benefit out of that economic value. And so motto, they have said, we are a near Arctic state. We are almost there. We are almost Arctic state now because of the huge investment, uh, a lot of uh, agreements and contracts with the various countries there, mostly with Russia, some with Greenland and Finland, etc. So China is already aspiring uh, to be a player, a prominent player in Arctic. Obviously, he doesn't mind Arctic route of shipping. So what is India's Arctic, po Arctic policy? So from climate issues, it has slowly taken a geopolitical issue for India now, with China trying to play a dominant role there. I'll quickly go through this Indian Arctic policy. It was issued in March 22. India has always been associated with Arctic from 1920, even before independence. Uh, you, uh, Britain had uh, nominated us to be a part of that treaty, which has given us some uh, free visa access and contact, uh, conduct of economic and commercial activities. So India has got some uh, open access to uh, the Arctic region because we are a party of 1920 uh, treaty. I'll just show the photograph of 1920 treaty. All these countries in green have signed this treaty, including India, which was a British colony then. So they all have access to Arctic uh, region for scientific uh, studies and uh, other commercial activities. And India has said uh, that they have created so many research stations there, as I told you earlier. But India also argues that whatever is happening in Arctic can happen in Himalayas. Global warming is there in Arctic. Global warming is there in Himalayas also. Ice will melt in Arctic. Ice can melt in Himalaya also. So they, they have already started calling Himalayas 
as the third pole of the earth north pole south pole are the two poles the third pole is himalayas and the glaciers and the snow fields they have lots of water there if they melt they'll come to the 10 rivers which are carrying this water to see of course uh, there will be repercussions on uh, the additional water coming in flooding will take place sea water will rise so studies in arctic will help us to understand the himalayan problem and of course the common issue is still global warming and therefore india has got a bigger role to play on the scientific front as far as arctic is concerned because we can utilize some of the conclusions some of the findings of the research what we can do in himalayas which are also having a similar phenomenon of global warming affecting the glaciers as i told you earlier uh, in himalayas we got glaciers because is on land water is guys okay so let's come to uh, the next uh, part of it this document is uh, available on the net so those of you who are interested in reading more about what all india is planning to do on climate control and exploitation of natural resources etc is all covered there but india has come up with another proposal don't use the arctic sea route don't allow the ice to melt is one issue don't use the arctic sea route i will suggest another route which is a combination of sea plus land and rail rail is again on land uh, to reach the western side i will show you this it's called international surface transport corridor they said this is an alternative to suez canal is also an economic uh, environmental friendly alternative to arctic shipping so many countries through which this route goes i'll show the map will benefit and they will not have to go through a long route via mediterranean this canal etc i mean they should not have to go so the route looks like this the traditional route is blue india said let's have sea up to chabar from chabar port chabar port you go via rail then you go across caspian sea by ship and again by rail so they have established a study feasibility of this study it will save cost by 30% if you have to go via the blue to st petersburg and moscow and other parts of europe then you will spend 30% more as compared to uh, what you will Uh, incur via suez canal and all these countries which are on this red route will also benefit their trade also can go from india they can also go from other countries which have got access to the iranian port and the first container movement from india to moscow has gone and come in july 22 so they have established the feasibility of this of this route as an alternative to the blue route and as also an alternative to the arctic route so india is trying to convey don't be in a hurry to establish arctic routes by ships try to make sure the ice doesn't melt i have got another route which i have already tried out which can be expanded and exploited by many countries which are in the central asian republic now is of course it has to have global acceptance to make sure this works so government is also encouraging uh, our indian companies to participate as i told you as per the 1920 treaty we have got open access to arctic region for both research scientific as well as uh, commercial activities so we are trying to get into arctic economic council uh, economic forum in a bigger way and india wants to ensure that there is more global cooperation in preventing uh, or checking the global warming so that other parts of the world don't get affected in their climate classic example is i be ourselves 
our bonds will get affected and india is trying to get more global cooperation and i think the g20 presidency which has come to indian prime minister now is come at the most appropriate time when we are uh, uh, able to share these issues with many other countries of g20 and we are able to get a higher level of global cooperation to make sure that arctic does not have uh, over development and thereby threaten its environment which can cause more melting of ice so what are the worrisome factors which you have talked about till now arctic ice if it melts adversely impacts indian monsoon i already explained this it will affect our agriculture it will cause flooding in many places we already started experiencing it in many places there will be a rise in sea level along the indian coast due to arctic ice melting as well as due to himalayan ice melting and sea water expands in higher temperature so roughly if you if the sea water goes up by 1 foot 100 feet of land will go under water very roughly 1 is to 100 this is what most of the countries uh, have the coastal area correspond to this but it again depends on continental shelf and other things but just remember 1 is to 100 is the ratio by which you lose land so it threatens population certain cities infrastructure indian ag economy is agrarian by nature it will get affected and if monsoon is erratic we may have food shortage after a couple of decades we may have unemployment in the agrarian sector so we need to be really worried about the changing patterns of monsoon and to make sure this does not affect our agriculture you have to change your crops based on the shift which is going to happen even though it may be erratic in the monsoon arctic routes if they open they will help china china will become more powerful than what it is today so it is a is an issue you have a neighbor who is powerful today he will become more powerful economically because the arctic route gives huge savings to him in its trade arctic routes may become a reality many people say in 20 years or so because by 2040 it they say it will open for four months it will spare china of taking the indian ocean route and i'll spend a minute on this i'll go to the map today china takes a red route it goes via mediterranean suez canal indian ocean and then it comes to andaman sea and here it goes very close through malacca straits so all the oil for china all the trade for china in out everything goes through this small malacca straits and thereafter it's very close to andaman sea where india can have a good watch on the type of traffic which goes and can uh, cause some uh, maritime threat to them so it's a strategic advantage to india if china follows a red line but if nsr becomes open they will not come via red they'll go via blue so we have a situation that if arctic sea route gets developed china not only becomes powerful it will also be free of this free of this threat perceived threat from india on the maritime front near malacca strait so it will weaken uh, whatever strategy you had in mind all these years saying how to tackle china now you will find the chinese trade chinese oil flow etc will take some other route and you will not be having any uh, dominance on that route because it's going very it is going through andaman sea right now as i told you china is a near arctic state is already trying to do it and it is becoming trying to become stronger through arctic shipping and also reduce its vulnerability in indian ocean 
So I come to my last slide, conclusions. Arctic ice melting has progressed at 4.5 percentage per decade. It's significantly come to around 18 to 20 percent less already. So at this rate, uh, very serious, grave, adverse situations can emerge in the Arctic ice. And Indian monsoon will get affected. I told you about the ocean belt, conveyor belt, how warm water will get move slow in Indian tropical waters. It'll get overheated, more evaporation, more, flood, more rain, more flood. This is bound to happen. So we have to make sure the ice does not melt in the Arctic. Agriculture will get affected, I told you. Arctic shipping will empower and strengthen China, we talked about. India's proposal for the surface corridor from Iran towards the uh, Central Asian Republic and towards Russia, its trials are over, but requires more global acceptance so that we are able to give alternatives to uh, the round world route through Suez Canal. And at the same time, the non friendly status of environmental friendly status of the Arctic group. So we are able to argue it out with the international community. So the only way you can control this is reduce Arctic ice melting, control it. And the only solution is climate control. Reduce your carbon emission. If you reduce your carbon emission, not only you, all the countries reduce their carbon emission, Arctic ice melting will slow down. Arctic ice will not open up shipping. And uh, all the other factors which I told you on uh, economic front, strategic front, and as well as also scientific front will, uh, will be uh, not an adverse situation for India. So Arctic, maybe 8,500 kilometers from here, it is 8,500 kilometers from India to Arctic. Depends where you want to go to Arctic, it could be even 9,000 kilometers. It is not just a geographical location. The amount of ice in Arctic controls the rain in India. So it is got a strategic domination it is a controller of our climatology in our subcontinent. We need to be aware of this and we should make sure that this does not become worse in the coming years and for our subsequent generations. And the only way you can do is reduce carbon emission. A topic which requires more discussion and another day. But today, the takeaway is Arctic ice can cause problems for us. And the only way you can tackle it is by reducing carbon emission. With this, I conclude my talk. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Jai Hind. Thank you, sir. Uh, Arctic region, Arctic region, Lula. Geographical Dedicate Kuchokas are rather good thematic expanded. Artic region, the climate neighbor Sarbaradu, winter minus fourteen, summer plus ten mula or region. The name of the Muda Masa Matraman of the summer season. Continent shelf, eight jingle day, with the eight continents in the continent shelves. Countries four million people Natural resources are rich Arctic Ocean, oil, natural gas, minerals, shipping routes, China, Russia, advantage India, Nashtangal Matraman and Sarvala Timai Parad. 
പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് ഇന്ത്യൻ മൺസൂണിനെ സാരമായത് അഫക്റ്റ് ചെയ്യുന്നു മഴയുടെ സാധ്യതകൾ അതുപോലെ തന്നെ ഫ്ലഡിന്റെ സാധ്യതകൾ അഗ്രികൾച്ചർ ലോസ് അങ്ങനെ പലതരത്തിലുള്ള നമ്മുടെ തനതായ രീതികൾക്ക് ഒത്തിരി പ്രശ്നങ്ങൾ ഉണ്ടാക്കുന്ന ഒരു റീജൻ അതുപോലെ ഹിമാദ്രി എന്ന് പറയുന്ന ഒരു ആർട്ടി ഇന്ത്യൻ റിസോർട്സിനെ കുറിച്ച് സാർ സൂചിപ്പിച്ചു ഐ എൻ എസ് ടി സി എന്ന് പറയുന്ന ഒരു സർഫസ് ട്രാൻസ്പോർട്ട് കോറിഡോർ മെച്ചപ്പെടുത്താനുള്ള ചില പ്രത്യേക താല്പര്യങ്ങളെ കുറിച്ച് സാർ പറഞ്ഞു തീർച്ചയായിട്ടും ആർട്ടി ഐസ് മെൽട്ട് ചെയ്യുമ്പോൾ ഇന്ത്യയിലേക്ക് ഉണ്ടാകാവുന്ന ചില പ്രശ്നങ്ങൾ അതുകൊണ്ട് അഡ്വാൻറ്റേജ് ഉണ്ടാകുന്ന മറ്റ് രാജ്യങ്ങളെ കുറിച്ചും വളരെ കൃത്യമായി ജിയോഗ്രാഫിക്കലായി പല പിക്ചറിൻ്റെ അടിസ്ഥാനത്തിൽ സാർ അത് എക്സ്പ്ലെയിൻ ചെയ്തു ആർട്ടിക് ഐസ് മെൽട്ട് ചെയ്യാതിരിക്കണമെങ്കിൽ കാർബൺ എമിഷനുമാണ് ആണ് ഏറ്റവും പ്രാധാന്യത്തോടു കൂടി ശ്രദ്ധിക്കേണ്ടത് എന്നും സാറ് വളരെ കൃത്യമായി സൂചിപ്പിച്ചു താങ്ക് യു സാർ വളരെ നല്ല രസകരമായ ഒത്തിരി ഇൻഫർമേറ്റീവ് ആയിട്ടുള്ള ഒരുപക്ഷെ സാധാരണ നമുക്ക് ആർട്ടിക്കിൽ പോകാനോ അവിടുത്തെ കാര്യങ്ങൾ മനസ്സിലാക്കാനോ ഒന്നും സാധ്യതയില്ലെങ്കിലും സാർ അത് വളരെ മനോഹരമായി എക്സ്പ്രസ് ചെയ്തു താങ്ക് യു വെരി മച്ച് സാർ Uh, we are very much enjoyed this presentation and we are waiting for uh, such another presentation we will wait very exclusive presentations from you thank you very much sir any questions if they are there i am prepared to answer yes sir apa arctic ice inde ingi arctic melting le inde ke poduve nashtam mathrame ullu ennalla oru conclusion aanu nammal kaanunnu alle adhe positive aayittu onnum namaku adinna pradheshikkanilla അത് മെൽട്ട് ചെയ്ത് കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ ഒരുപക്ഷെ നമ്മളുടെ അടുത്ത് കൂടെയുള്ള ആ കപ്പൽ പാത പോലും മറ്റേ ഡയറക്ഷൻ കൂടെ പോകാനുള്ള സാധ്യതയും today uh, for their oil for their exports imports all travel through that they have to go through uh, bay of bengal and go through this malacca strait to go to south china sea and reach china easiest to path are you know easiest to path no that is only path oh it's the only path today so uh, the vulnerability is there for uh, their commercial shipping uh and uh, if you are uh, talking in naval battle uh, parlance if you are blocking them their oil flow can get checked if you are blocking them he may be able to do it may not be able to do it but that vulnerability is there but tomorrow if another route opens up they will not use this route yeah yeah the vulnerability yeah. is lost the security the security aspect le ipo or problem undu alle yes there is a huge problem if arctic shipping opens there's a huge problem it will become free of this present bottleneck apart from that it will become more powerful yes sir because of savings in transportation anybody else okay. thank you sir vera endengil samshayangal arakkan undengil chodikkam anybody else i'm not able to the screen le saabu mathre varunnullo i it is not switching between speakers സംസാരിച്ചാൽ മാത്രമേ മാറത്തുള്ളൂ സാർ ഓക്കെ ജോർജ് സാർ സാർ ഇപ്പോൾ കാണുന്നില്ലേ ഇല്ല ഐ ആം ഓൺലി സീയിങ് യു സാർ സാർ മാ ഇതി ചെയ്തിരിക്കുകയാണ് സ്പോട്ട് ലൈറ്റ് ചെയ്തിരിക്കുകയാണ് നോ ഐ ഹവ് സ്പീക്കർ അനുസരിച്ച് മാറേണ്ടതാണ് ആ നൗ ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് ചേഞ്ച്ഡ് ഓക്കെ ആണ് ഗോ യാ സാധാരണ ആരും തിരിഞ്ഞു നോക്കാൻ പോലും പറ്റാത്ത ഒരു മേഖലയെ കുറിച്ച് സാറ് സവിസ്തരം പ്രതിപാദിച്ചു വരാനിരിക്കുന്ന കാലാവസ്ഥ വ്യതിയാനം അത് പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് ഭാരതത്തെ നേരിടാനിരിക്കുന്ന ആ പ്രതിസന്ധികൾ അത് സാമ്പത്തികമായിട്ടും അതുപോലെ നമ്മുടെ കാർഷിക രംഗത്തും വലിയ പ്രതിസന്ധി ഉണ്ടാക്കുന്ന കാര്യത്തെ പറ്റിയുള്ള വ്യക്തമായ ഒരു പിക്ചറ് ഭയാനകമാണ് ഓർത്ത് ചിന്തിച്ചാൽ 
അപ്പൊ ഒരേ ഒരു പ്രതിവിധി സാർ പറഞ്ഞു കാലാവസ്ഥ വിപരീതമായി തീരാതിരിക്കാൻ പരമാവധി ശ്രമിക്കുക നമുക്കും ഒരു ഗ്രീൻ ബെൽറ്റ് ഒരു നല്ല ഹരിത കാലാവസ്ഥയ്ക്ക് വേണ്ടി ശ്രമിക്കാം അതിനു വേണ്ടി ശ്രമിക്കാം സാർ താങ്ക് യു താങ്ക് യു സോ മച്ച് അങ്ങനെയുള്ള സ്ഥലങ്ങളൊക്കെ വെള്ളം പോകുന്നതിന് ഒരു പ്രധാനപ്പെട്ട കാരണം ഈ ആർട്ടിക്രൈസ് ആർട്ടിക് വൈപ്പിൻ എന്നൊക്കെ പറയുന്ന സ്ഥലങ്ങളില്ല വൈപ്പിൻ കോസ്റ്റൽ ഏരിയ അവിടെ വാട്ടർ റൈസ് കൂടുന്നതിന്റെ വെള്ളം വെള്ളത്തിന്റെ the melting is taking place more every time in winter the ice accumulates in summer it melts not fully partially again in winter it accumulates summer it melts little bit so this balance has been maintained in earth for thousands of years but in the last 40 50 years this balance is getting upset slowly slowly there is more melting than before and enough is not getting rebuilt that mean enough ice is not getting rebuilt because of global warming so it is becoming slowly slowly adverse yes. and more water water level will has to raise the sea level has to raise and plus we have a problem of uh, himalayas the himalayan ice if it melts that also flows into the sea yes roy sir Yeah. Sir, it's a great knowledge as far as concern to this venue. One of the things that the Arctic region is the same as the Arctic and the Antarctic area. This is the difference between the two of us. That's why we have the Arctic region and the governance of natural resources. അപ്പോ ഒരു ഷിപ്പിംഗ് റൂട്ടിന്റെ കാര്യങ്ങൾ ഇതൊക്കെ വേറെ അതിൽ ഇൻട്രസ്റ്റ് ഉള്ളവർക്ക് മാത്രം കിട്ടുന്ന ഒരു ഭാഗമാണ് പക്ഷെ ഇത് വളരെ അധികം യൂസ്ഫുൾ ആയിട്ടുള്ള ഒരു ഇൻഫോർമേഷൻ ആണ് ബൈ ചാൻസിന് ആക്സിഡന്റിൽ കിട്ടിയതുപോലെയാണ് എനിക്ക് തോന്നുന്നത് കാര്യങ്ങൾ അത് തന്നെയല്ല അതിൽ വരാവുന്ന വിഷയങ്ങളും എല്ലാം വളരെ സയന്റിഫിക് ആണ് സംഗീത ഈ സയന്റിഫിക് ആയിട്ടുള്ള കാര്യങ്ങളെല്ലാം ഒരു ജനറൽ അവയർനെസ്സും ഒരു നോളജും തരുന്ന കാര്യത്തിൽ വളരെയധികം യൂസ്ഫുൾ ആയിരുന്നു അതുപോലെ തന്നെയാണ് കഴിഞ്ഞ ക്ലാസ്സും ഒക്കെ ഇത് വേറെ എങ്ങനെയും കിട്ടുന്നതല്ല പിന്നെ നമ്മൾ ഈ ബുക്കുകളൊക്കെ വായിച്ചെടുക്കുക എന്നൊക്കെ പറയുന്നതും ബുദ്ധിമുട്ടുള്ളതാണ് പക്ഷെ സാറിൻ്റെ ഈ പ്രസൻറ്റേഷനും ഈ അറിവും വളരെയധികം യൂസ്ഫുൾ ആയിരുന്നു അപ്പം തന്നെയല്ല ഒരു ജനറലായിട്ട് ഇതിനെക്കുറിച്ച് സംസാരിക്കാൻ പറ്റിയില്ലെങ്കിൽ ഒരു ജനറലായിട്ടുള്ളൊരു അവയർനെസ് വളരെ നല്ല ഇൻഫർമേറ്റീവ് ആയിട്ടുള്ള ഒന്നാണ് പിന്നെ നമ്മുടെ ആർട്ടിക് റീജിയനിൽ ഇത്രയധികം ത്രെറ്റ് ഉണ്ട് എന്ന് ഇപ്പോഴാണ് മനസ്സിലായത് അത് ആർട്ടിക് റീജിയനിലൂടെ ഒരു സീ റൂട്ട് ഉള്ളപ്പോൾ അവിടെയും സെക്യൂരിറ്റിയുടെ വളരെയധികം പ്രശ്നം ഉണ്ടായിരിക്കാം പിന്നെ അതെ കൺസർവേറ്റീവ് ആയിട്ടുള്ള ഒന്ന് ബാക്കിയുള്ളവരെല്ലാമാണ് എടുത്തോണ്ട് പോകുന്നതെന്നും ഇതിൽ നിന്ന് മനസ്സിലായി നമുക്ക് അത് വേണ്ട വിധം യൂസ് ചെയ്യാനായിട്ട് സാധിക്കുന്നില്ല പിന്നെ കാർബൺ എമിഷൻ കൂടുന്നു അതിനെ നമ്മൾ എങ്ങനെ അതിനെ ലഘൂകരിക്കാം പിന്നെ ഇത് മഞ്ഞ് ഇത്രയധികം മെൽറ്റ് ചെയ്യുമ്പോൾ ചെയ്തിട്ടാണ് ഈ വാട്ടറിന്റെ ലെവല് കൂടുന്നത് അപ്പം അത് ആ വാട്ടറിന്റെ ലെവല് കൂടിക്കൊണ്ടിരുന്നിട്ടുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ ഇപ്പൊ തന്നെ നമ്മുടെ കാലാവസ്ഥ അഫക്ട് ചെയ്യുന്നത് വളരെ മോശമായിട്ടാണ് ഇനിയും അത് മോശം സാധ്യതകളിലേക്ക് കൂടുതൽ വൈഡായിട്ട് പോകുള്ളൂ അപ്പൊ അതെന്തായാലും അതിന് ഒരു സെക്യൂരിറ്റി പ്രശ്നം എല്ലാ തരത്തിലുമുള്ള സെക്യൂരിറ്റി ആയ ആർട്ടിക് റീജിയനിൽ ഉണ്ട് എന്ന് ഇപ്പോഴാണ് മനസ്സിലാവുന്നത് വളരെ നല്ല ഇൻഫർമേറ്റീവ് ആയിട്ടുള്ള ക്ലാസ് ആണ് അപ്പം ഇതിനെ എന്ത് എങ്ങനെ നമുക്കത് പ്രതിവിധി ചെയ്യാമെന്ന് കൂടുതൽ പഠിക്കേണ്ടിയിരിക്കുന്നു Uh, I just want to tell you, India does not have any claim on any resource in the Arctic. I'm not going to say anything about it. No, sir. 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 No,
ഇല്ലല്ല അത് നമുക്ക് വി ഹാവ് നോ ക്ലെയിം അവര് നമുക്ക് വെക്കുകയാണെങ്കിൽ വാങ്ങാം അത്രയേ ഉള്ളൂ പക്ഷെ നയൻറ്റീൻ ട്വന്റി ട്രീറ്റി അനുസരിച്ച് വി ആർ പെർമിറ്റഡ് ടു ഡു റിസർച്ച് ആൻഡ് സയന്റിഫിക് എക്സ്പെഡീഷൻ ഡേർ ആസ് പെർ നയൻറ്റീൻ ട്വന്റി ട്രീറ്റി so yeah. india you can have your scientists there you can analyze temperature water density and then come to conclusion study what is the impact on indian monsoon uh, and look at uh, how the ice is melting because we have a problem in himalayas so it will become useful for us so that way we have an advantage so 8500 kilometers away ice melts you will have flood in uh, kotem kotem yes for the reason which i explained to you yes yes exactly sir thank you thank you sir aryan uh, sir kekunnado balagobalan sir yeah the informative and ellarum parney seriyana adu rendu threat um kuda he has revealed what is that ക്ലൈമാറ്റിക് കണ്ടീഷൻ കൊണ്ട് നമ്മുടെ അഗ്രികൾച്ചർ പ്രൊഡക്ഷൻ എഫക്റ്റ് ആവും അഗ്രികൾച്ചർ നമ്മുടെ എംപ്ലോയ്മെന്റ് കുറയും പിന്നെ ചൈന കുറെ കൂടെ പ്രോസ്പറസ് ആവുന്ന ലക്ഷണമാണ് കാണുന്നത് സോ ചൈന പ്രോസ്പറസ് ആയിക്കോട്ടെ അതിന് വിഷമമില്ല പക്ഷെ അത് നമ്മുടെ പുറത്ത് ചാടിക്കളയും അതാണ് കുഴപ്പം അല്ല കണ്ണന്റെ ടോക്ക് അഫ്കോഴ്സ് എന്റെ അനിയനായതുകൊണ്ട് പറയില്ല എല്ലാ ഇൻഫോർമേറ്റീവ് ഫ്യൂച്ചറിസ്റ്റിക് ടോക്സ് ആണ് ഫ്യൂച്ചറിൽ എന്ത് വരാൻ പോകുന്നുള്ള ടോക്ക് ആണ് ആക്ച്വലി ഇങ്ങനെ ടോക്സ് ആണ് ആൾക്കാർ കേൾക്കേണ്ടത് പ്രസ യങ്ങർ ജനറേഷൻ കേൾക്കേണ്ടത് പക്ഷെ നമ്മളെ ആൾക്കാരുടെ ഇപ്പം ഇന്നത്തെ പേഴ്സണലി കണ്ടാൽ എന്നാ അറിയാം ഞാൻ ആരെയും കുറ്റമായിട്ട് പറയുകയില്ല ഈ ഓഫ് റിപ്പീറ്റഡ് സബ്ജക്റ്റ് പറയുമ്പോൾ പത്ത് മുപ്പത് നാൽപ്പത് പേരും ഈ പ്രോബും അഡ്വേബും കേൾക്കാൻ വേണ്ടി ആൾക്കാർ വന്നിരിക്കും ഇങ്ങനെയുള്ള ഫ്യൂച്ചറിസ്റ്റിക് വരുമ്പോൾ ആരും വരത്തില്ല അതൊരു നല്ല ട്രെൻഡിൽ അറ്റ്ലീസ്റ്റ് ഈ ട്രൈറ്റ് പോപ്പുലറൈസ് ദീസ് ടൈപ്പ് ഓഫ് ടോക്സ് എമങ് യങ്ങർ ജനറേഷൻ അവർ നമ്മളൊന്നും ഈ മുപ്പത് ഇരുപത് മുപ്പത് ഇരുപത് നാൽപ്പതും കാണാൻ വഴിയില്ല എന്നെ പോലുള്ള ആൾക്കാരൊക്കെ പ്ലീസ് ആ കുട്ടികളെങ്കിലും കേൾക്കട്ടെ എന്നുള്ള അഭിപ്രായക്കാരൻ ഓപ്പർച്യൂണിറ്റി collect it assimilate then uh, make a presentation and try to make it as simple as uh, possible without uh, too much of uh, scientific and technical issue thanks a lot thank you very much bye thank bye you, sir it's a wonderful presentation like we are waiting thank for the uh, next section thank you yeah, thank bye. you abu ende ide njan naale ayachu tharam ketta hari bye ide idu share cheyanulla in case enikku cheyan vittilla ningal cheyana nammala ende ah okay monday no problem okay Okay. okay good night sure. thank you good night right see you